And me and this technology stuff. Let's see. Every week it's like starting all over brand new again to figure this thing out. What not? Uh, hopefully, anyhow, while I'm pulling this up, uh, thank you, uh, Sister Carol, for leading um, this evening. Um, good evening to everybody as well. And um, hopefully you've had a great week. Um, I know there's many ups, many downs, <clears throat> excuse me, in our uh, weeks that we have. There's sickness, there's death, there's heartache, there's pain. You know, so many things that we go through. Um, you know, but it's, it's definitely a blessing to um, wake up each day and be able to come together, whether it's church, whether it's prayer meeting, whether it's, um, you know, just family and friends. Um, it's great to be able to have that. So I'm very thankful to be here this evening um, and be able to go over more of the book of Revelation, <clears throat> excuse me, each person present uh, tonight. Um, and as was stated, we are starting in a new chapter. If you can see it on your screen, for those who can see it on your screen, we are in Revelation chapter two now. We're now going to get into the uh, seven churches um, of Revelation, and that's going to cover Revelation chapter two, verse, Revelation chapter two, as well as Revelation chapter three. Um, and then at the end of uh, each of those chapters, we'll do a review like we did last um, last chapter. I don't know. Maybe I maybe I'll wait till the end of chapter three. That way, I can do it with all of the churches at one time. That's probably what I'll do um, to cover it. You know, to cover the review with with all of the churches at once. But nevertheless, we are here. Revelation two one to seven. Christ's message to the church in Ephesus. Let me have a word of prayer, and then we will get into it this evening. I think I have about uh, fifteen or sixteen slides. Uh, so it shouldn't take us uh, all the way to eight o'clock, but who knows? We'll see. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I uh, pray that as we go through more of the book of Revelation, Lord, that uh, Jesus might truly be revealed to us. Lord, we understand um, that there are end time events to happen, but we truly need a relationship with you, Lord, to be able to withstand everything that is going to come upon us. Lighten our minds, uh, open up our spirits, Lord, to receive your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. All right, so we are going to um, go to Revelation 2, 1 to 7. I'm going to have it on the screen. Um, this isn't like church on Sabbath where I, I say, you know, don't worry, I didn't send a text in. You're not going to be, be able to see it on the screen, turn in your Bible. So Wednesday night, you kind of get to make it. Uh, but don't worry, Sabbath is coming. So you will have to turn uh, to, the, to the actual text in your Bible or whatever device you use it on. Um, but Revelation 2, 1 and 7, Christ's message to the church in Ephesus. So we're going to deal with the church of Ephesus, same as we did last time, where we highlight uh, certain key things in um, those particular verses. Right. So I try to pick out I try to pick out what's the uh, some of the most important phrases in the book, in each uh, verse and give information on those or whatnot. And so and you'll see that more. Sometimes you're gonna see where I highlight a the because it's a definite article and that definite article is something that's very important um, that's there. So you're gonna see me highlight different things at different times or whatnot. Um, so just, you know, I, I really hope that each person gets a whole lot from these because um, this stuff can really, really truly open up your uh, mind to understanding the book of Revelation um, as we go through it. And you'll be able to understand things in a way that you probably never understood them before. Um, so that's why it's it's very important to go over things that aren't just um, what we're typically used to, because there's so much more in the book of Revelation. So anyhow, enough of that intro. The key point that um, I want to bring out in these particular verses is where it says each of these messages to the churches while being personalized letters were not individualized. Personalized, but not individualized. There's a difference between it being personalized as well as individualized. These letters weren't individualized, meaning that the whole book of Revelation, that's Revelation chapter one through Revelation chapter 22, was sent to each church to be read by all seven churches. Again, these are actually seven churches that they're sent to. So. When you think of the seven churches and you think of the book of Revelation, um, Ephesus wasn't the only church to receive uh, their specific letter to Ephesus, which is seven verses. 
they also receive Smyrna's. They also receive Pergamos. They, they also receive each of the other churches and they receive Revelation as a whole. Revelation chapter one, Revelation chapter two, all the way to chapter uh, 22. So again, there's a difference between it being personalized and individualized, right? So again, each of these messages to the churches, they're personalized, but they're not individualized. The whole book of Revelation was sent to um, each one of the churches. So the, the church of Pergamum was able to see what was sent to the church of Ephesus and vice versa. And same technique with all of the seven churches. Here we go. Revelation chapter two, verses one through seven. I'll read verses. I'm going to read it a little slow. Um, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And we remember that from Revelation chapter one, where, you know, there's the vision that John has of, uh, of Jesus and there's the uh, uh, seven stars in his right hand. So we, it's, it's the same imagery that he saw from Revelation chapter one. Again, and I said this Sabbath to those who remember, chapters and verses weren't originally there in the Greek. Chapters in, or in the Hebrew for that matter either. Chapters and verses come about later on for congregational settings. So that way, as the preacher's preaching or whatnot, you can say, turn to Revelation chapter two, verses one, and you know where to go. But in the original, Revelation is just all together. So when they receive it, they don't receive it as Revelation chapter one, verse one, Revelation chapter two, verse one. They receive the entirety of the book of Revelation or whatnot. And so that is very important, important to understand because there's actually no break between Revelation chapter 1 verses 20 and Revelation chapter 2 verses 1. It flows all together. So he's continuing on and he says to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Then over to verse 2 he says, I know your works, speaking directly to the church of Ephesus. I know your works, namely your labor and endurance. I know what you did. I know how you persevered. And that you cannot bear, bear evil ones. You don't like evil. And that you have tested those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you have found them to be liars, verse 3. And you have perseverance, and you have borne up because of my name. And you have not grown weary. So all of this to the church of Ephesus. But, right, there's that little conjunction. But I have against you that you have left your first love. Verse 5. Keep remembering. Therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works. But if not, I am coming to you and I will, I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, right? And we're going to touch on who the Nicolaitans are. Lastly, verse seven, the one who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. For the one who overcomes I will give to him to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Again, when you're reading, um, and since we're just referencing Revelation 2, 1 to 7 right now, when you're reading this and John is writing it, he's writing it specifically to the church of Ephesus. He doesn't have um, any church in Lake Region in mind. He doesn't have any church in the United States of America in mind. None of those, right? You've got to you've got to step away from that mindset and step into what John was writing to specifically, right? So when he's writing, he's saying, "Look, you know, I have this against you. I hate the Nicolaitans, right? The Nicolaitans is a specific group per se, and we're gonna we're gonna touch on that in a second, right? So he's writing to something very specific. What we want to pull out as we're reading this is the various principles that are in there." That relate to us, right, in the 21st century. So let us move on. Key point. Seven stars and the seven lampstands both stand for the seven churches. We saw this from Revelation 1, which also means that Christ has complete control over the whole church. Why? Because he has it in his right hand. The right hand is a sign, a side and sign of favor. His presence is in the church and he has full knowledge of the church's situation and needs. Nothing escapes his eyes. So he understands what was going on in the church of Ephesus, just like he understands anything that's going on in any other church, right? He says, I know it. 
I know what's happening. I know what's transpiring, right? My presence is there with you. I got all knowledge of the situation and what's needed right now. So here's some here's some historical information. And for each of these churches, I'm going to give you some historical information um, because, again, this is it, this is important. I'm one of those individuals uh, who love background. Background gives you context as to the what and the why. Why is this individual writing it? What's going on around? What's the um, main thing that's worship in that particular area? Background background provides so much that is needed when you're looking at a text because again, biblical authors are not writing to people in the 21st century. Yes, the Holy Spirit guided individuals to write He's writing a letter to specific things. So never negate the historical aspects that are important. So I want to give you some as it relates to the city of Ephesus. The city was located about 60 miles from Patmos. If you remember from Revelation chapter one, Patmos was the island where John was um, exiled off to. So Ephesus, this specific city, right? Because he's writing to a church in a city, this specific city is 60 miles from Patmos. At the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, Ephesus was the largest and principal city of the Roman province of Asia, a very, very important city. As a metropolis, it was a, it was a famous and important political, commercial, and pagan religious center. Various gods were worshiped there, right? So the city was home to the many-breasted goddess of fertility, Artemis or Diana, whom all of Asia and the world fanatically worship, right? So this was a major center for a specific type of worship, a specific God who was worshiped, right? The temple possessed the right asylum, it had a specific asylum there, right? If any, per if any man committed a crime, he could reach the precincts of the temple before he was arrested and he was safe. So basically, your mind might go to a city of refuge from the Old Testament, right? Ephesus had one of those types of things. that They had an asylum for that. That immunity extended to an area of one bow shot or 200 yards, right? Again, they don't use the same measurements as we do, right? So bow shot is equal to 200 yards. That's like the length of two football fields all around the temple. Thus, the temple housed the choices of criminals in the ancient world, because these criminals, right, these criminals, if they made it to this, to the steps of this particular area, they were safe, right? It's almost like, all right, I, I committed a crime, I'm gonna run away. If I make it to this temple, if I make it to this, to this area, then I'm safe, right? And so the city housed one of those particular areas, right? All that historical background, there's some more historical aspects of Ephesus. It was known for its superstitious practices and magical arts. If you remember Acts chapter 19, remember where you had those itinerant priests, right? And 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 um, uh, Paul has to cast out, cast, cast demons out of them and all that kind of stuff right there. And they run off naked and everything like that. That was in Ephesus, right? Ephesus was known for its superstitious practices and magical arts. That is one of the major things that happened in that particular city. So what the city he's writing to, the church that he's writing to within the city of Ephesus is the same exact Ephesus that you find in the book of Acts chapter 19. Into Ephesus, there poured a stream of criminals of every kind, fugitives from the law, escapers and avoiders of justice. And into Ephesus, there flowed a torrent of credulous, superstitious people. For in a superstitious world, Ephesus was well nigh the most superstitious city in the entire then known world at that time. So again, the context, the historical context of what John is, of where John is writing to, is a very superstitious <laughs> city, very much so. That plays a part, right? Because different elements of things would likely creep into the church because of how this particular city was. This church was housed in a superstitious city where a major god, the goddess of Diana, was worshipped, right? A lot of criminals in this particular place. So certain things were bound to creep in simply because what surrounded the city. Trust me, your surroundings 
play a major, major part, right? And so again, historic understanding um, um, the historical context is a major, major role as to what John is trying to say. All right, some of the key phrases that we are going to cover um, in this verse, uh, uh, Revelation chapter two, verses one to seven, is the phrase, those who call themselves apostles and are not. Also, but I have against you that you have left your first love. Also the phrase, keep remembering. Um, also, I will remove your lampstand, which you don't want to happen. Um, Nicolaitans, who are they, et cetera, et cetera, overcomes, those who overcome, Jesus' appraisal of the church, and Jesus' counsel to the church. So we're going to cover those things very quickly, um, and then we will wrap up for this evening. All right, those who call themselves apostles and are not. Church of Ephesus um, basically was a doctrinal sound church that does not tolerate evil men and test those who call themselves apostles to see if they really are not. If I was to think about this particular church, the Church of Ephesus, especially as it relates to doctrinal sound, it's easy to think of this church as one like the Seventh-day Adventist Church who, who has the 28 fundamental beliefs, who um, we are doctrinally sound church. We don't like evil. We don't like evil practices, even though different things go on, even though different things creep into the church, right? But this was a church that, that had a doctrinal foundation, right? They were sound in what they believed. They did not tolerate. We ain't going for the evil. We And again, there was evil all around. There was criminals all around. There was the worship of the goddess Diana all around. There was a lot of things going around. But the church, it, the, 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 the church did not tolerate those things. And they were ready to test anybody who called themselves an apostle because we got to see. You got to see, are you really what you say you are? You know how the Bible says you shall know them by their fruits. And so this was a church that was doctrinally sound, didn't tolerate evil. And we're going to test everything to see who this is, what this person is about before we just accept those who call themselves apostles and are not. But he then came to this but where it says, I have something against you. Yes, you're doctrinally sound. Yes. You, you, you're ready to test every person who says they are apostle of God. Yes, you, you, you don't tolerate evil and things like this, but I still got something against you, right? I've got something against you, and that is you've left your first love. What, what, what is he talking about? Okay, so the Church of Ephesus, they basically began to backslide in their love for Christ and their love for others, right? Love for Christ and love for others is so important, right? Our horizontal and our vertical relationship, our vertical relationship with God, our horizontal relationship with others, it matters. It, it, it truly matters, not just in these last days, but all through Christianity. How we treat people truly matters. How we treat people in the church, how we treat people out of the church, right? And so these individuals began to backslide, even though, again, they're doctrinally sound. They've got everything. They know all their 28 fundamental beliefs. They know the Bible. They can they can quote every Bible text for you. They know the writings of Ellen White. They know all of that stuff. But they started to backslide from their love for Christ and their love for others. And so Jesus has something against these individuals. Even though you can quote every single text, but you've truly lost your love for Christ and others. Listen, I got something against you. Religion in the church of Ephesus became legalistic and loveless. Again, they knew all the doctrines. The vertical relationship with God normally defines the horizontal relationship we have with humanity. That is a powerful statement because how you view God is basically how you're going to treat others, right? I, I hit on that a little bit this past Sabbath, right? I think we I think sometimes we need to re-examine how we truly treat people because how we're treating others is, is showing what we truly think about God. Trust me, it is very important how we treat others, right? As, a, a, and shows how we truly feel about God and emphasizing the soundness of doctrine and check, checking the orthodoxy of their fellow members, the church was abandoning the love, the loving characteristic of the gospel and became legalistic. Oh my, 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 my. Man, I, I mean, there's so many ways that, this can relate to us in these days, right? I know a lot of times we just like to focus on the church of Laodicea, but there's so much in each one of these churches that relates to us. We, we, tend, to, we tend to find ourselves either in a legalistic standpoint or a liberal standpoint, and finding that middle of the middle of the road is often very hard for us as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, right? But, but let's continue on to see what 
what they're actually what he's actually John is actually trying to say. So the church it was abandoning its loving characteristic of the gospel, right? It was becoming more legalistic. The Ephesians put their whole emphasis on the side of sound doctrine and hard work. Oh my 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 my. We gotta make sure we gotta make sure you quoting every Bible text right. We gotta make sure that you're doing all the things that you're supposed to do, right? Yeah, that's all good and dandy. But if it if you become so legalistic in it as these Ephesians had, then you're, you're stepping away from your first love, you're stepping away from the true essence of the gospel. It was a good decision, but they were backsliding from true ardent love for Christ and their fellow believers that characterized them in the early day, in the early days. They had left their first love, their, their genuine love of the gospel. See, as we get more sophisticated in this Christian walk, and we start to learn so many more things in the word of God and in the spirit of prophecy, sometimes we find ourselves a little too pharisaical, right? And, and, and we start to point fingers at different people, and then we make the gospel so much more complicated than the gospel actually is. The gospel is very simple. <laughs> very, very simple. We tend to compound salvation. We tend to compound so many things, but it's very, very simple. Jesus came and lived and died and rose again. Will you choose it or will you won't? Very simple. But then we started throwing, well, don't you got to do this? Don't you got to do this? Don't you got to do this? Ain't nobody negating it. But if it's lead leading you to a legalistic approach and a, and a bad dealing of people, then you've, you've backslidden. You've left your first love, even though you come to church every single week and so jesus had that uh, had that against them and he tells them keep remembering right so in the greek this present imperative suggests a continuous and an ongoing attitude of action keep on remembering in the greek concept remembering is not simply recalling but bearing in mind it's not just oh a sliver of thought within the within the back of your mind somewhere but it's actually bearing that in mind to keep on remembering do not forget never let it slip your mind never forget never let it separate never let it be separated from your thought process or your thought pattern keep on remembering it's a present imperative that continues on and on and on and that is the attitude that we have to have and then and then it said in the text i will remove your lampstand the lampstand emblem and we saw this from revelation chapter one um it defines the role of the church as god's witnessing people in the world right the warning to the church in ephesus that christ will remove their lampstand from its place parallels the saying of jesus in mark 4 21 and 25 and luke 8 16 to 18 where those who fail to shine their light will have their light bearing role taken from them if you aren't bearing your light what is your purpose? What is your purpose in this whole Christian experience, right? If you are living this thing, if this thing isn't shining out from you, it's going to be removed one way or another. And so for the church of Ephesus, it needed to keep on remembering. It needed to step out of their legalistic mindset. It needed to return to its first love because if it did not return to its first love, that lampstand with that light that they were to bear was going to be removed from them. Now we arrive at the Nicolaitans, right? Um, according to the early Christians, the Nicolaitans were the heretical uh, followers of Nicholas of Antioch, which if you go back to Acts chapter 6, verses 5, he's listed as one of the seven deacons of the early church. And that particular deacon of that, that particular deacon, Nicholas, um, he ended up in, in some heresy, right? And so their presence, these Nicolaitans, their presence in the church threatened to destroy the integrity and purity of Christian faith and conduct. And so, in essence, these Nicolaitans started to creep into the church. Remember the city of Ephesus. It, 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 there was a lot of evil that was going on. There was a lot of false worship that was going on. Um, the the Ephesians in within the church they hated uh, false doctrine. They hated um, um, people who were not true apostles. They hated. However, just as the devil is crafty as he is, these Nicolaitans started to creep in with their heresy within the church. And Nicholas is a compound Greek word, and it means the one who conquers people right and so these nicolations were coming in even though this was a church of sound doctrine they knew the 28 fundamental beliefs let me pause right there and there's something that ella white says in the uh, referring to the last days and she says that 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 god will permit people to come into the church and present false doctrine to wake our sleeping cells up right and she says that we are in a death stupor many of us are asleep right 
and, 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 and when you're asleep, you don't even know you're asleep. You know what I'm saying? And so the fact of the matter is many in the church are asleep and we're caught up in this thing of we come to church one day a week or we come to church two days a week and that's the extent of our Christianity, right? And and, and God is going to permit false doctrine to creep in even as it happened in this church, right? And even though they knew sound doctrine, even though they knew the 28 fundamental beliefs and these, these Nicolaitans, right? It's the compound Greek word is the one who conquers the people. They were conquering the people who knew the word of God. The Nicolaitans likely taught that Christians are freed from all law and can live as they wish, right? That's the opposite side of um, legalism is the, the liberalism. They perverted the teaching of Paul and turned Christian liberty into Christian license. So they're teaching these Nicolaitans are teaching you can do whatever you want. There ain't no standard. You can do whatever you want. You can live however you want to live. All you got to do is believe in Jesus. Yes, believing in Jesus is what you have to do, is what you need to do. However, you can't just go out here just living any old type of way. That's not, that's not how Christianity works. And so these Nicolaitans started to creep in. And of course, to individuals that are having a hard time with, uh, man, listen, you know what? Uh, I don't really like this doctrine of the church. I don't really like Ellen White. I don't really like this and I don't really like that. Individuals that are having a hard time with these things, it's easier to get these type of people with the simple fact that they already don't like certain things. And so, okay, we're going to come in there and we're going to create havoc and we're going to spread false doctrine. Folks, folks, it is important to not only know your Bible, but to live this thing. Live it and know it. These Ephesians allow different things to creep in. Then the Bible says to those who overcome, right? And so this present this present participle, it implies a continuous victory. Keep on overcoming or continues to be victorious. We were talking about this in Sabbath school. Uh, I think it was two Sabbaths ago, right? And oftentimes when we listen to people's stories, um, we want everybody, especially you know, those who have been in the church for so long or whatever, or the pastor or the elder or the whatever, we want everybody to already have overcome. But that's not how the, that's not even how this text works. This present participle it implies continue to be victory, victorious, right? Keep on overcoming. That means keep working. That means you ain't done with the process yet. God ain't done with you. You ain't done. And so that should that should help us to not point fingers and make certain things harder for individuals because everybody, we're all supposed to be in this constant, continuous overcoming process, right? So let's be more conscious of helping people versus pointing the finger. And so Jesus had to tell these individuals, this church in Ephesus, Keep on overcoming. Keep on vic being victorious. Yes, you may take a step back, but keep on going forward. Keep on overcoming. And now we come to the appraisal um, that he gives to the church. This appraisal was very positive. The church is praised for great qualities. They're exhausting hard work and patience, and their members have not grown weary. That's his appraisal of the church. Hey, you guys are, you guys are doing good. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm on, I'll work hard at what you do. You're patient. And you have not grown weary in what you were doing. Then his counsel to the church is he makes he makes a strong appeal with three imperatives. And he says, keep remembering, repent, and do the first works. Go back to what you're doing. Sometimes when we get lost, we gotta go back. We gotta we gotta take a step back and look back and start back where we uh, where we left off at to go forward. Sometimes you gotta go backwards to go forward. Do those first works that you know how like when we first come into the church. Sometimes man, we're so on fire and then somehow that fire dies out. Go back. Do the first works that you were doing. Keep on remembering. Repent. And these are continuous pop. Um, continuous actions. Keep on, keep on remembering. Keep on repenting. Keep on doing the first works that you did. Don't let that flame go out. Don't let your fire go out. Keep on doing. That's the counsel that Jesus has to the Church of Ephesus, but He also has that counsel to us as well. And so, with these counsel He gives, it means bearing in mind and keeping afresh the past and applying it to the present. Also, repentance donates uh, notes a radical change of the whole direction. Of life in the Hebrew, um, when you see that word "turn," 
um, it's the Hebrew word is shuv, and basically that means you were literally going in one direction, and you shuv or you turn and you start going in a whole different direction. That's what repentance is. You were going one way, right? But then when you snap out of it, you turn around and you headed in a whole different direction, right? And so that's repentance, right? And then he says the first works are the outcome of the first love. That first love that you had, that flame, that fire, return. Unto that. And then the last slide I want to share with you this evening, the key point of the application is that upholding doctrine and church order, right, without focusing on Christ is useless. And religion not based on the gospel has no value. It's a rather, it's a, it is a rather lifeless, dead religion, right? If you do not have Christ in the midst of the church, in the midst of your religion, it is lifeless and dead. The Pharisees could quote you up and down. They knew it, but it was missing the heart, right? And so we can know everything. We can uphold doctrine. We can uphold church order. You got to do it this way. You got to do We can do all of that. But if it ain't focused on Christ, then it is useless and pointless. And what are we doing? So let us remember, saints, let us remember that everything we do, we need to make sure our focus is on Christ like how the song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's what we have to do in everything, the pain, the problems, the hurt, the joy. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. I love how Steph the Christ says, no matter what goes on in life, we need to naturally turn to Christ as a leaf turns to the sun or as a flower turns to the sun, right? When a problem comes our way, turn to turn as that leaf or that flower does to the sun, turn to Jesus. Everything must be Christ-centered and Christ-focused. Other than that, we've got a dead, lifeless, dried-out religion that nobody is going to want. Let me pray with you, saints of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that uh, we've learned something about the Church of Ephesus, Lord God. We've learned something about the Nicolaitans and how uh, even, in, even in this day and age that individuals can creep into the church and teach false doctrine. Help us to be aware. Help us to understand the word of God. Help us to know it. Help us to live it. Heavenly Father, and help us to be Christ-centered individuals, Lord, not to be legalistic, not to be liberal, but find balance in you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. Amen, amen.